Good, mor good morning, good afternoon. My name is Karen Kay, a recovered compulsive eater from Syracuse, New York, and my credits don't transfer. And yes, again, it is June 4th, 2021, and a nice sweltering day here in Syracuse, New York, and uh, lots of humidity. And we have our guest speaker today, which is Harlan G. If you have any questions during the meeting, please contact either the, co the host or the co-host by private message in the chat mm -hmm. function. Please note that the speaker Harlan G will be recorded for the duration of the study. However, Q&A answers session, which follows, will not be recorded. We will post a link to the previous recordings in the chat function. We ask that you make sure your microphone is on mute at all times today during the study. Please also turn off your video if you're exercising, eating, or if you need to step away from your screen for any reading reason. And I've also put in the chat uh, the uh, seventh tradition. And with you know more bit of do, let's welcome Harlan G. Please unmute thank Harlan. You. Thank you very much, Karen. And thank you to everybody who makes this meeting possible. This would this this is not anywhere close to coming in and listening to me. There are people behind the scenes who record these. There are people behind the scenes who do enormous service so that these recordings can be accessed and so on. So I'm eternally grateful to all of you who make this possible. It's Saturday, the 5th of June, 2021. And whether you're listening on recording or you're listening to this live today, I hope it's as beautiful a day where you are as it is in Arizona today. In Scottsdale, Arizona, it is just a God-given day. I get out in the morning and I do my walking and wow, what a beautiful day it is today. We have been talking and we are in the chapter Two Wives. And in just a few minutes, we'll be at the bottom of page 105. But before we get to that point, let's kind of review, as is my want, of some of the things that we have been talking about in this chapter Two Wives. And even though the title of the chapter for some can be rather off-putting because what it calls us back to is a, an image, at least that I get a picture of, an image of a rough and tumble alcoholic man and his little doting wife. And what we're gonna learn, and if we just, if I, we just keep our minds open a little bit, which is what I had to do, the chapter is about so much more than that. It's about how we interact with each other, how we interact with sponsees, how we interact with our sponsors, how we interact with the world around us. And no matter who you are, you have to interact at some point with people around you. And so this chapter can be rather eye-opening of the narcissism, the ego-driven madness that can cause me to take my will and my instincts, where's mine, where's mine, where's mine, and take that to such absurd extremes. And my script and my Machiavellian, Machiavellian desire to get my way and engage in the self-pity and the attention-seeking behaviors that I dwell, that I love so much, that are like a, a, a drug to me, that they can destroy the relationship between me and others. And ultimately, if I engage in these self-seeking behaviors, they can erode my relationship with God, my higher power. And what else can they do when that is in place? They can drive me back into the arms of a Nestle's Crunch Bar. Because what happens is my brain, my soul, will search for that effect. And what is the effect? The effect is that sense of ease and comfort that comes instantly by eating certain foods. And I eat the foods in search of this effect. And then what happens is I trigger the physical allergy. So is this chapter tied in to the steps? You bet that it is. Because again, just to kind of review, let's take a look at something important. The chapter working with others is about the 12th step, but the 12th step is a definite three-part step. 
the first part is having had a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. The second part is we tried to carry the message, this message to compulsive overeaters. <clears throat> and the third part of the step is <sighs> that we practice these principles. What are the principles? The principles are the steps. We practice these principles in all of our affairs. Now let's take a look at how brilliantly the book is laid out. What's the first chapter after seven is eight and it's two, two wives. The next chapter is gonna to be to the family afterward. And the next chapter is gonna to be to employers. What are my three most predominant areas of affairs? My wife, my spouse, or the people closest to me. And then it goes into the family and then it goes into the workplace. So these are very, very important chapters. Now let's take a look at page 105 at the bottom and I'll give you a second to catch up with that. If we turn to that page and we turn to that paragraph, we seldom had friends in our homes at the bottom of the page. This is where we're gonna pick it up for today. We seldom had friends at our homes, never knowing how or when the men of the house would appear. Now let's just take a look at that sentence and let's take a look at something that calls us to look at our disease. And the word that jumps out at me from my childhood, my mother, now I told you that my mother was profoundly mentally ill. My mother had three distinct personalities. She could be a screaming, raving lunatic. She could be a two-year-old or she could be a fairly together person. My father was about as steady as a rock. My dad was pretty much the same all the time. He, he didn't hear, he wasn't very moody. They were both compulsive overeaters. But the word that jumps out at me when I read this sentence about not being able to, uh, to, to you know, know what was going to happen is unpredictability. The disease makes us unpredictable people. No one really knows whether they're going to get the compulsive overeater who's sated on the lazy boy, full of sugar, full of food that can barely keep their eyes open, or are they going to get the crazy Tasmanian devil? And I should have used him for my background today. I have a picture of him. But are they going to get the crazy Tasmanian devil, the person who is that whirling dervish who is in search of food and who's absolutely cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And that's what's gonna be very, very important for me to take out of this, out of this little uh, half paragraph is this unpredicted, there's Taz, but it's that unpredictability that makes me so volatile to the people around me when we came to live almost alone. Now, I've talked to enough alcoholics in my life to know that they end up in the same place, most of them, maybe not all of them, but most of them end up in the same place that we do. And that is very, very isolated. Yes, alcoholism may seem at first to be very social, unlike compulsive reading. You know, they drink and they have keggers and they're all, you know, drinking. But what happens to most alcoholics that I have seen is as their disease progresses, they become more and more isolated, more and more as time goes on, they can't interact with those people and they isolate and it becomes a very lonely, solitary existence. So in that respect, they end up in the same place, even though they might st not start off like we do but we were very, very much almost alone all the time. When we were invited out, our husbands sneaked so many drinks that they spoiled the occasion. If on the other hand, they took nothing, their self-pity made them kill joys. And when I would go out to places, not all places, but most, I would either eat everything or I would eat nothing. And it just depended on where I was. And sometimes I had my policeman uh, when I say I had my policeman, what I mean by that is certain people would get on me about eating and I didn't want to ruffle their feathers. If there's anything I hated, and I still do really, more than just about anything, it's confrontation and conflict. Confrontation and conflict are not my strong suits. 
like anybody, I have to confront certain situations all the time, but I really rather not if I don't have to. So when I wasn't eating, I would be full of self-pity and I'd, be, I'd get angry and I'd get very, very uh, volatile emotionally because I was feeling sorry for myself. And no matter what anybody around me did, it didn't seem to matter because nobody was able to fill me up with food and give me that effect that I so desperately, desperately desired. And so going out there was, was, was always very difficult for me. Thank God now, thank God. See, I've said this before, God heals me in ways I didn't even know were broken. Now I can go to a function. Now I can go to a party. Now I can go where there's people and I either bring my food or I eat before. I have wonderful friends. I moved here to Arizona to be close to people that I have known my entire life. And so I'm very, very lucky to have these friends, to have people in my life. And I'm, I know that I'm, I'm, I have something to be grateful for. But a lot of times I have to remember their eating habits are not my eating habits. Their habits are not my habits. So I have to make accommodations for it. And when I do that, it goes just perfectly. It goes just great. Let's continue. Bottom of page 105. There was never financial security. Positions were always in jeopardy or gone. An armored car could not have brought the pay envelopes home. The checking account melted like snow in June. Now, I want to bring you back to a time in the 1970s and early 80s. My food habit at that time was about 100 to $150 a day. And my income was nowhere near that. Wrote a lot of bad checks, did a lot of stupid things, did a lot of very bad things. So I lived in that insecurity and knock wood today through the grace of God, through the steps and fellowship of this program, through the mercy of God and through all of you who have pulled me through the muck. My credit is so good that I can buy a car with the chain, without even the change in my pocket being put down. I have a brand new car sitting outside my home and I paid cash for it. But they said to me several times at the dealership, they said to me, if you want us to finance it, here's the situation, here's the deal. There were banks in Chicago at one time that would not have given me five singles for a five cash because I had alcoholic credit. And it took a long time and it took the patience and love of friends. It took the patience and love of God. And it took a lot of hard work on my part and the part of my higher power to bring me to the point today where that is no longer even close to the case. I've even had a divorce 11 years ago, which kind of rocked me a little bit, a, a lot financially, but I've come through with phenomenal credit and I'm very, very grateful for that today. Now, I don't, I'm not a millionaire, but I can easily live according to my means. And that is 100% a product of this recovery. This recovery process has healed me in areas that I did not even know were broken. And so this is one of the miracles that I've seen in my life is that today I have excellent credit. Okay, top of 106. Sometimes there were other women. How heartbreaking was this discovery? How cruel to be told they understood our men as we did not. Now, I've never cheated on my wife. I've never kissed anybody's wife. I've never kissed anybody's girlfriend. That is not my, that is not my story. There's no way that that's my story. But what, what does that really speak to? So much of the time, it speaks to this desire that we have to get that effect. And we're looking for things that we, we, we don't even know. We're turning over every rock on the beach in search of happiness and peace and contentment. And we know now we're not going to get it maybe from a three musketeers bar. <clears throat> but sometimes what happens 
with spending, shoplifting, love addiction, sex addiction. We start looking for it in other areas because if I'm not in fit spiritual condition, if I'm not in fit spiritual condition, then I'm going to look for that effect in any way that I can find it. And I can do a lot of damage, a lot of damage. I have a friend of mine. He lives in Chicago. I knew him from the, from the radio business that I'm in. Nice guy, heck of a nice guy. He's been married five times. Every time he gets married, this is the girl, this is the girl, this is the one I've been waiting for until she's not, until she just can't do what he wants her to do and be who he wants her to be. And he's very, very miserable, very miserable about it. And he goes looking for these things and he never really finds happiness at any kind. It's just hard to watch him. It's hard to, it's hard to look at this kind of situation. And I happen to have had a conversation with his daughter. Oh, this is maybe 20 years ago or more. This is probably 30 years ago. This is probably 30 years ago, maybe. Yeah, about 30 years ago, I had a conversation with his daughter and he has, he has kids from different wives. And the conversation went basically something like this. Harlan, I wouldn't pee on him if he was on fire. And I don't want his money. And I don't want him in my life. He cheated on my mother. How do you repair that? How do you get past that? Sometimes we do such damage, such damage. And only God can repair that damage. Only God can join those situations up with his love and repair them, make something out of them that, that is wonderful. It's a very tough thing. And what is the problem? The problem is the lack of power, that being our dilemma. We can't resist that temptation. And my wife, she was involved with a man while we were still married. It was a, it's a very, very painful thing to hear your own wife tell you that she's been seeing this man and she's fallen in love with him. So I tried to talk my wife out of divorcing me, uh, not, out of, not just out of desperation. There was some desperation there maybe, but I really felt like families should stay together. I still, I still wish that you know, it, it went down differently. But she told me she's in love with this guy. She's been carrying on with this guy. You know, what can you do? There comes a point where you just have to say, Okay, you know, there's not much I can do to, to fix this or, or to, you know, hang on to it. You got to let it go or be dragged. Isn't that the expression? Let it go or be dragged. I'm pretty sure it is. All right. Top of 106. The bill collectors, the sheriffs, the angry taxi drivers, the policemen, the bums, the pals, even the ladies they sometimes brought home. Our husbands thought we were so inhospitable. Joy killer, nag, wet blanket. That's what they said, next day they would be themselves again and we would forgive and try to forget. It is very, very difficult for a non-addicted person to understand the mind of the addict. Very, very difficult that we as addicts, things often make perfect sense to us that make sense to no one else. I have done things in my life when I look back on those things where I sort of had a picture that this is okay. And my friends are scratching their heads going, what in the world are you thinking? What on God's earth are you thinking? And I've had friends of mine that have done that. There are things they do and things they think and things they say that make sense to them. But what is the lesson of this paragraph here? What is the lesson here in this paragraph? And that is that I need to understand that all these bums, all these women, all these men, all these other things are me trying to fill up my soul with something that is going to give me that effect. Because boys and girls, Food, sex, gambling, shopping, shoplifting, whatever's out, drugs, whatever's out there was never the problem. It was the solution to the problem. 
if that's the solution to the problem, then what's the problem? The problem is the buildup of human emotion. All human beings have happiness and fear and love and frustration and jealousy and anger. All human beings have these emotions. All of us do. But normal people, normal people can dissipate these emotions through very simple things. They can go drive out a bucket of golf balls. They can walk around the block. They can play with the dog. They can go to the gym. They can listen to music. Whatever it is that they do, and we see them every day, we see them. And they knock these emotions down to the point where they're okay and they can live. I can't, I'm an addict. And as these emotions start pinballing around inside of me, what's gonna happen is my brain is gonna sense the disturbance. My brain is gonna sense that I don't really feel so good. And it's gonna send me a signal that I am going to listen to. And the signal is, go eat some Chips Ahoy cookies. And I don't want to eat Chips Ahoy cookies. But the signal is so seductive. The signal is so beautiful. It's so harmonious with the universe that in search of relief from the untenable, searing, unrelenting pain of not eating Chips Ahoy cookies, I will eat Chips Ahoy cookies in search of relief from the pain because eating becomes a step up from where I am in the absence of the steps. And I eat a cookie. And when I eat that cookie for about nine seconds, I feel fantastic. Fantastic. Nothing in the world feels quite like that. That's what Dr. Silkworth calls the effect. Now, when I eat the cookie though, something else happens and this is not so good. I'm going to trigger whether I want to or not, whether I know it or not, whether I want to or not, I am going to trigger the physical allergy. And that physical allergy is a manifestation of the allergy to sugar, flour, fried foods, uh, different high power sugar foods for me, that different kinds of things like that. And that allergy is an abnormal adverse reaction to the food, beverage, or substance, in this case, a Chips Ahoy cookie. And I'm gonna be set up with an irrefutable biological craving for more of the same. And the more I eat, the more I'm going to want. And the more I want, the more I eat, the more I eat, the more I want, the more I want, the more I eat. And it is just endless. And not only do I end up gaining back any weight I may have lost on a diet, but I'm always on that bonus plan. Lose 80, gain 170. Lose 170, gain 370. I never get back to where I was. I always catapult beyond it because once I lose control, I lose control. So when I'm looking for love in all the wrong places or I'm shoplifting or I'm engaged in love addiction or I'm engaged in alanonic behavior, trying to control people, trying to write the script for the people around me, it's all going to boil back to the same thing. So we can tie it together and it becomes less about the wife, less about these other people, and more and more about us as the addict. I hope I'm making that clear because the point I want to make is this. This is not a chapter of us looking at the behaviors of others, either cynically or sympathetically, whether you're looking at the behavior of others sympathetically or cynically is not the point. The point isn't to look so much always at the behavior of others. The point is we're looking at our own behaviors. We are addicts, we are food addicts. 
I'm a compulsive overeater. I was 335 pounds by the time I was a senior in high school. I was 500 pounds by the time I was a sophomore in college. I was 600 pounds by the time I graduated college and 700 pounds by the mid to late 80s. There are people on this line. I, I definitely know at least one or two. I don't know if they're still on the line. I know one is one I just interacted with before the meeting and there was another one. The, just take this person for an example. Uh, this is a person who, if you looked at this woman, you would say to yourself, this is obviously a model or a movie star. This is obviously someone who's in the movies or TV or ads or something because she doesn't show the ravages of the disease in terms of obesity. She's an exercise bulimic. And there are three types of bulimics. There's exercise bulimia, there's regurgitation bulimia, and then there is laxative bulimia. There's three types of bulimia. And then this is a person who also has anorexic tendencies. And these anorexic tendencies give her a feeling of euphoria when she limits her food, restricts her food. So these are the things that give her that effect. Is she as much a compulsive overeater as I am? You bet your life. We're in the same program. We've known each other for years. We've attended conventions together. I've traveled to the state that this person lives in and so on, and we've visited back and forth. It doesn't matter whether you, it doesn't matter what side of the coin that you're coming from. It doesn't matter whether you're coming from the anorexic side or you're coming from the extreme morbid obesity side or something a little more tempered in the middle. Maybe you never reached the weights that I talked about. You don't have to, but remember this word, yet, yet. Because the disease is permanent, progressive, and fatal. It will get worse over time, never better. The disease is a living, breathing organism. The disease is a living, breathing organism. And it will feed off of anything that it can. It will feed off the fear, the anger, the happiness, the euphoria. It will feed off anything it can to get itself healthy. And when the disease is healthy, I am not. When I am healthy, the disease is still fighting for its life. And how does it fight for its life? By gearing me maybe towards some shopping that I don't need to be doing. I don't mean grocery shopping where I need things. I mean buying things I don't need. Maybe gearing me toward having a, an affair with somebody who's inappropriate. Maybe gearing me toward stealing. Maybe gearing me toward whatever that may be. So the point that I'm trying to make, and I hope I haven't overstated it, because sometimes I get a little, uh, con I, I get a little doubtful if I'm if I'm describing it. As much as we need to in this chapter, maybe look at the behavior of others. What this chapter is really telling me is that these behaviors are not so much for me to peruse in others, but for me to peruse in myself. Very, very important. Let's continue. Page 106, we have tried to hold the love of our children for their father. We have told small pots their father was sick, which was much nearer the truth than we realized. They struck the children, kicked out the door panels, smashed treasured crockery, and ripped the keys out of pianos. In the midst of such pandemonium, they may have rushed out, threatening to live with the other woman forever. In desperation, we have even got tight ourselves. The drunk to end all drunks. The unexpected result was that our husbands seemed to like it. Addictive behavior is insane. Remember the jaywalker? Remember chapter three more about alcoholism. The original working title of the chapter, more about alcoholism was more truth about alcoholism. And they made him take that out of there. They said, no, it makes us sound like we think we're experts in alcoholism and we are not. 
and he took the word out, but he took it out reluctantly. Bill, I'm talking. Bill took it out reluctantly. But in that chapter, there is a description that our behavior is plain, pure insanity. What's the most insane thing I've ever done? And I've done some pretty crazy things. But the most insane thing I've ever done is to, while sober, while abstinent, while, while I am free of the food, to pick up that candy bar, to pick up that chicken, that whatever that is, egg rolls, whatever that may be for you, cookies, fried foods, whatever, whatever it is for you, and put it in my mouth, knowing what it's going to do to me, but in my mind thinking, this time, although that's never worked, that's, remember Dr. Silkworth says, we cannot distinct, we cannot tell the difference, differentiate between the true and the false. Here's the truth. Every single time I eat Doritos, I end up eating more Doritos than I had originally planned. And I not only eat Doritos, but I will eat everything in sight. And I will go on a bender that will last far, far longer than I had ever intended in my life. Every single time. But yet, if I stop working the steps, eating that Dorito will just make perfect sense. Make perfect sense. Because the sexiest ideas come to me with my own voice in my head. And they just make perfect sense. That's the disease. That's the illness of compulsive overeating. That's where it is. Let's continue. Perhaps at this point, we got a divorce and took the children home to father and mother. Then we were severely criticized by our husband's parents for desertion. Usually we did not leave. We stayed on and on. We finally sought employment <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> Sorry, as destitution faced us in our families. I thought at one point when it got this hot in Arizona that my allergies would, would die down a little bit, and they have, but now they seem to be making something of a resurgence. I don't know if this is like their return tour or something. And I'm not crying, but it just, I don't know if my allergies need this return tour or something. I don't know. But anyway, okay. We began to ask medical, I'm at the bottom of 106, guys. We began to ask medical advice as the sprees got closer together. The alarming physical and mental symptoms, the deepening pall of remorse, depression, and inferiority that settled down on our loved ones. These things terrified and distracted us. As animals on a treadmill, we have patiently, wearily climbed, falling back in exhaustion after each futile effort to reach solid ground. Most of us have entered the final stage with its commitment to health resorts, sanitarium, hospitals, and jails. Sometimes there were screaming delirium and insanity. Death was often near. This disease does not care who it kills. This disease does not care what it does to you. It will make you say things to people that you love that you wouldn't say to your worst enemy. It'll make you do things to your own children and the people closest to you in the world that you will deeply regret. And even in the face of that regret, you will do it again. This disease will make the most insane behavior seem rational and normal. We are people with egos and the disease feeds off that ego. And that ego tells me that I'm right and you're wrong and I'm good, and you're bad, and I'm left, and you're right. This disease will force us into behaviors that will shame us, disgrace us, and hurt the people around us, and ultimately will kill us. The disease is permanent, the disease is progressive, and the disease is fatal. I have a friend that lives in Oklahoma. He says the disease is permanent, progressive, and fatal. He calls it the three Ps. He says fatal. Under these conditions, we naturally make mistakes. Some of them rose out of ignorance of alcoholism. 
I'm going to stop right there for just a second. Alcoholism is more than drinking. Compulsive overeating is more than eating. Gambling is more than gambling. Drug addiction is more than drug addiction. Al-Anon is more than Al-Anon. It's the behaviors, it's the ideas, it's the justifications that we make so that we can justify how we live and what we do and the behaviors that we want kept secret from the people around us, that we just wish they would go away long enough to let us consume our food and then come back. And too often they know our shtick, they know our stuff, they know our routines. And so what happens ultimately is that this disease is not only a killer, it's a destroyer. And it's a destroyer of anyone close to us. Again and again and again in this chapter, not only are we going to say, yes, we didn't understand the alcoholic illness, we might have behaved differently, yes. But what we're going to find out is that it's not just about observing other people, either sympathetically or cynically. It's about us observing ourselves. So much of that is how we relate to ourselves. Let's face a fact. In the final analysis, it's about our relationship with our higher power, with God. I have friends of mine who live 20 minutes from me right, right now. That's why I moved here. I have friends of mine that I've known for 60 years. I love them. They love me. We know each other. I, I knew their parents. I knew their grandparents. I knew this. I knew their aunts, their uncles, their this, their that. And they knew my mom. They knew my They know everything about me that there is to know. When I lived in Chicago, this may seem strange to you because you think of Chicago as a big, dangerous place. We never locked our back door. When I was a kid, we left the back door open. Why did we leave the back door open? So that anybody that wanted to could come in. And it never backfired on us. No crazy people ever. Well, there were crazy people, but the, all the people that came in were our friends, were my friends. And my house was their house. And their house was my house. And it didn't really matter what house it was. We were at home no matter where it was. But the point that I'm trying to make is they will never understand, no matter what you do, why I ate a second candy bar why I ate a second hamburger. They will never understand that in a million years. And because they don't have the disease of compulsive overeating, they were not subject to the behaviors that we're describing here. So they couldn't understand why a lot of my behaviors manifested themselves and why my behaviors were so debilitating when theirs were not. I destroyed my own life, not because of some hatred of myself, even though that's what it appeared. I didn't destroy my life because I hated myself. I destroyed my life because I listened to the disease and I ate food that took me out of the running for every dream that I dared dream. Every dream I ever dreamed of getting a good job, of dating, of love, and of, of whatever, went up in smoke. It went up in smoke, and I ended up selling on the phone, even though I hate it. I hated it then, I hate it now. What was I supposed to do? I was five, six, seven hundred pounds. Where was I going to go to get a job? Who was going to hire me? Unless they needed a new freak at the zoo or the circus, who in the hell was going to hire me? Nobody was going to hire me. Nobody. Thank God today I can report to you that I make a living. I'm not rich. I, I wish I could retire. God, I wish I could stop doing this. But you know what? My bills are paid. My house is mine. I'm, I pay my mortgage, but you get the idea. I own my home. I paid cash for my car. So God stepped in and said, I'm going to make something good out of this, Harlan. Get out of my way. 
get out of my way. My dad couldn't get out of his own way. My dad died. He wasn't worth this notebook financially. He wasn't worth $10 financially when he died. But my dad died where everybody loved him. And he was a lovable guy. He was a sweet guy. Everybody liked him. There were a ton of people at his funeral. That place was packed to the rafters. There wasn't a seat in that place. They had to bring extra chairs in in the back, as I recall, when my father died. That's the kind of person that he was. If he had $10, he'd give you 20. If he had five, he'd give you the same 20. He didn't give me much, but he gave me everything he had. Does that make sense? He didn't give me much, but he gave me everything he had, and there was nothing too good for me. Okay, how could men, I'm in the middle of 107. How could men who love their wives and children be so unthinking, so callous, so cruel? Let's stop right there. There are many of us who love the people that we abuse. There are many of us who were, they loved us. And they did unspeakable things. But we're not looking at that so much right now. We're looking at our own behaviors. We loved a lot of people. If you put us on a witness stand with a Bible and said, do you swear to tell the truth? Yes. Do you love this person? Yes. Why did you treat them that way? We don't know ourselves. But we do know that it comes from the disease. It comes from the illness. And there's only one solution to this illness. And I want to keep saying it and saying it. And it's not self, self, um, self-control. It's not anything that is of self. It is a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. Without a spiritual awakening as the result of the step, I will continue eating. And in the food, I will find these behaviors again. Let's continue. There could be no love in such persons, we thought. And just as we were being convinced of their heartlessness, they would surprise us with fresh resolves and new attentions. For a while, they would be their old sweet self, only to dash the new structure of affection to pieces once more. Asked why they commenced to drink again, they would reply with some silly excuse or none. It was so baffling, so heartbreaking. Could we have been so mistaken in the men we married? When drinking, they were strangers. Sometimes they were so inaccessible that it seemed as though a great wall had been built around them. When I am in this disease, I cannot behave rationally. Rationality has nothing to do with my behavior. I'm gonna either overreact or underreact. I'm either gonna to go to catastrophizing or being scared to death. I'm gonna to go to anger. I'm gonna to go to fear. I'm going to go to extreme behavior, extreme behavior. In the recovery, I can pause when agitated or doubtful. Somebody's unmuted. I can pause when agitated or doubtful. What do they mean by pause? To me, it means step 10. Step 10. They just didn't want to keep saying it over and over and over again. Step 10. I can do a step 10 when I'm agitated or I am irritated. And so I have that mechanism, step 10, with which to get centered. The most beautiful color in recovery is gray, deep gray, neither black nor white, gray, right in the middle, right in the middle, moderation. Yes, it's black and white that I don't eat certain things. That's going to remain black and white for the rest of my life. There are certain behaviors I do not engage in. There are certain places I don't want to go. There are certain things I don't want to do. Not all the time. A good job. I say I work with plenty of people. Unmuted. Somebody is definitely unmuted. Okay. So the bottom line is, is that the gray is where my life works best. Okay, let's continue. We're at the bottom of 107. And even if they did not love their families, how could they be so blind about themselves? I'll give you the answer in one word. 
the disease. disease. The disease blinds me. We make mountains of molehills and we make molehills of mountains. What had become of their judgment, their common sense, their willpower? Why could they not see that drink meant okay, okay. somebody's definitely on you? Why was it when these dangers were pointed out that they- It's too much stress. Yeah, this world- Pause. I've been getting the person. Yeah. You need to stay in your yeah. Crazy. Something happened with Cheryl. Okay. All right. Can Cheryl, you, can you, you take... Cheryl Ann, can you mute, please? Okay. okay. We're okay, good. Harlan. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Top of 108. We got drunk again immediately. Why did I get drunk again? When I say I got drunk, I don't mean on liquor, I mean on food. I'm just using the terminology of the paragraph to try to make it a little more understandable. Why in the world would I do this again and again and again and again and again? Why is it that Dr. Bernstein at Edgewater Hospital screamed and yelled at my mother in 1970 when I broke my ankle at Mather High School? in Chicago on the north side. And he screamed at my mother and said, he is over 300 pounds. He is 17 years old. He isn't going to live to see 30. And we went to an ice cream place on Devon Avenue and tried most of the 31 flavors right after that. Why? Because we were both compulsive overeaters. That's what we do unless acted upon by a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. I'm going to continue these behaviors because I've got no other solution. Remember that food is not the problem. Food is the solution to my problem. It is not the problem. There are some questions. I'm at the top of 108. These are some of the questions which race through the mind of every woman who has an alcoholic husband. We hope this book has answered some of them. Perhaps your husband... <clears throat> <clears throat> has been living, sorry, in that strange world of alcoholism where everything is distorted and exaggerated. And this is one of the key sentences in this entire chapter. Forget about the husband and wife dynamic here. It's not important. What's important for me to know here is that I am an addict. And when I am in my addiction, I live in a world where everything is distorted and exaggerated. Now, when I say I distort and exaggerating and, and exaggerate, that doesn't just mean that I make a big deal out of everything. I made a small deal out of what was happening in my life, that my life was going to hell in a handbasket that I was living in a world of eating and not eating. And I was living in a physical world where I could not function physically. I was living in a world where I was three times the size of anybody around me, four times the size of anybody around me. I couldn't get in a car. I couldn't get out of a car. I couldn't go to a movie. I couldn't fit in the seat. I couldn't walk, I couldn't stand, I couldn't bend, I couldn't, I couldn't function in the world. I went on my first date with a girl. I was 35 years old when I went on my first date. You think I chose that? I was unhealthy. I had swelling in my lower extremities. I still do to some degree, but I had swelling that was so fierce that it was as painful as, as you drilling into my head. And yet the only solution that I had was more and more eating. So exaggeration and distortion does not just mean I overdo something. It is also to see and minimize, minimize, not minimize, minimize what was going on in my own life. Where I wasn't washing myself properly, 
where I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't putting on clean clothes every day. I wasn't doing the things I needed to do. There are so many manifestations of the illness that it's not just about eating and not eating. You can see that he really does love you with his better self. Of course, there is such a thing as incompatibility, but in nearly every instance, the alcoholic only seems to be unloving and inconsiderate. It is usually because he is warped and sickened that he says and does these appalling things. Today, most of our men are better husbands and fathers than ever before. I am warped and I am unloving and I am inconsiderate when I am in this disease. I am warped. I do not see reality. I don't see reality. I see what I want to see and I minimize. And it is only through sponsoring and only through my interactions with other compulsive overeaters that these things become more apparent to me because I can see myself through your stories. And hopefully you can see yourself through my story. We teach each other with our pain. We teach each other with the things that we share. We teach each other through the examples that we set. Some of us, regrettably, are going to become cautionary tales. And some of us will be examples to follow. I would rather be an example than a cautionary tale. My friend Sherry in Chicago, I should have married her, but I didn't. I was too stupid. She's been dead now for 20 years, a little over 20 years, probably 24 years, 23 years. She was a therapist, therapist. What a doll, what, a, what an unbelievable intellect. The world is less artistic. The world is less um, purple. She loved the color purple. Oh, she loved everything purple. Uh, the world has less blues music aficionados now that she's gone. And she died at about 400 pounds alone in her condo in Chicago on Marine and Montrose because she would not put the food down until she could do the forensic analysis of why she was eating it. If you're looking to figure it out, stop, forget it. It's a waste of time. Here's the why that you're looking for. You have an allergy of the body and a twist of the mind. The allergy is when the food is inside of you, causes you to eat against your will. And the twist of the mind makes it impossible for you to stay stopped because the mind is in search of the effect. What is the effect? It is that sense of ease and comfort that comes instantly by eating certain foods. Here is the solution. Work the steps. Work them every day. Work them every day for the rest of your life and don't stop working them ever. Remember my friend Naomi in New Jersey? She came up to me. I was doing a retreat there. And she came up and said at lunchtime, she says, can I call you when I'm done with the steps? And I said, no. And she said, why not? She looked at me like I had seven heads and I was purple. I said, because when you're done working the steps, you'll be dead. And as far as I know, there's no phone in the box. And she laughed. And to this day, she and I can laugh about that. And I have her permission to tell you the story. But the bottom line is still this. There's nothing to figure out here. This is not that complicated. If you're finding that it's complicated, you're probably doing it wrong. It's a simple program. And these behaviors that we're discussing in this chapter, we find after a while are far less about the wife or the husband or the brother or the sister or the whatever, the next door neighbor, and so much more about ourselves. Let's continue in the time we have left. Try not to condemn your alcoholic husband, no matter what he says or does. I wanna, I wanna change the sentence here just a little bit 
I'm going to ask Bill Wilson up in heaven, my hero, my mentor, Bill Wilson, to forgive me, but I'm going to change some, one word here. Try not to condemn yourself. See, I spent my life doing crazy things. And then I spent the rest of my life beating on myself and hating myself and shaming myself and punishing myself for doing crazy things. Stop the hemorrhaging. When you're in recovery, you won't do so many crazy things. You were sick. So where it says, try not to condemn your alcoholic husband, no matter what he says or does, try not to condemn your alcoholic self, no matter what you've said or done. The trick is don't keep doing it. Don't use that as a justification to continue doing it. Here is just, an, he is just another very sick, unreasonable person. I am a sick, unreasonable person, but I am a child of God. I am sick. I am unreasonable. I am unknowing. Be kind and loving to the weak, the wrong, and the unknowing. Be helpful of the striving and have a realization that in your life, you will be all of those things. You are a human being. You made mistakes. Others have made mistakes. Forgive, forgive. It's not going to help us. What is the payoff to those resentments? They let us abdicate responsibility for our own life. Forget about it. It's not working. It's not working. It's not going to work. I have to let it go. I have to let it go. And the only thing I can hope for, for them, not necessarily for me, but the people that I have angered and the people that I have wronged will forgive me as well. Leave retribution to God. That's the best way to have the best life possible. Treat him when you can as though he had pneumonia. When he angers you, remember that he is very ill. When you think back on some of your own behaviors or the people closest to you, remember they are sick, sick people. There is an important exception to the foregoing. We realize some men are thoroughly bad intentioned that no amount of patience will make any difference. An alcoholic of this temperament may be quick to use this chapter as a club over your head. Don't let him get away with it. If you are positive he is one of this type, you may feel you had better leave. Is it right to let him ruin your life and the lives of your children, especially when he has before him a way to stop his drinking and abuse if he really wants to pay the price? <clears throat> there is recovery available to anyone who wants it. There are 118 of us on the line this morning. After the question and answer period, if you are on the struggle bus, if you are on the struggle bus and you need a sponsor or you need something, there are going to be people that are going to be on this line and they will help you. Why will they help you? Because their life depends on it. And because they actually give a damn. Because the pain that you feel and the alienation that you feel is exactly what they have felt too. They understand firsthand what it's like to live in the world that you are living in right now, where you just can't seem to see the forest through the trees. The problem with you, with you struggle usually falls into one of four categories. Next week, we're going to go into the four categories and we're going to examine these things. That'll be next Saturday, same time. So please join us. We're going to crack open this chapter and we're going to go into the four types of drinkers. One, two, three, and four. So we're going to do that. What I would like to do now, and we're finishing right on time, which is 
not usually my case. I either finish too late or way too late, either one or the other. We're going to open it up for questions. Before I bounce it back to Karen, and I have no idea if she's even here because I can't see her, but what I before I do that, I just want to remind you of two, three things about the questions. Number one, if you asked a question last week, please stand back, hold back, let people come forward and ask their question first. Yeah. Number two, no food questions. And for the love of God, no math questions. No math questions at all. So uh, no, so I'm going to bounce it back to Karen Kay in New York. Okay, Harlan, another wonderful job. You almost had me in tears. Um, I just uh, wanted to thank you again for another stellar job. I'm going to stop the recording.